Now, for the third time this week, the world has recorded its hottest temperature on record. The global average hit 17.23 degrees Celsius on Thursday, days after intense heat waves in China, as well as the United States and Mexico, the latter leading to around 100 deaths. Well, for more details, uh, I'm joined now by Christina Dahl, Principal Climate Scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Thank you very much uh, for being with us. First of all, what's causing all these high temperatures right now? Well, right now we really have a trifecta of things happening. So obviously it's Northern Hemisphere summer. So this is naturally one of our hottest times of year. We have the El Nino phenomenon, which is, has shifted into its warm phase, which is typically associated with higher temperatures around the planet. And on top of those natural forces, we have human-caused climate change, which decade by decade is just generally making our planet hotter. So without that human element, it's unlikely we'd be breaking so many records like we are right now. Uh, when can we expect uh, things to cool down again? How long is this El Nino effect going to be lasting? You know, the El Nino is very um, unpredictable in how long it lasts, but it typically peaks in the winter time, And so it's surprising to see so much additional warmth this early in an El Nino phase. But um, we can expect to see warmer temperatures for the, for the months ahead. We've been seeing some of the uh, uh, bad effects of these high temperatures already. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of deaths in Mexico. What other consequences are there of these high temperatures? Yeah, high temperatures have a number of different effects. So obviously they can affect our health and can be so severe to, uh, to our health that people can perish. Um, we've also seen crops failing, livestock uh, perishing in the heat. Um, we see our power grids that provide us electricity drain to the point of there being long blackouts in many countries. Um, and we also see um, uh, sort of indirect effects. So the extreme heat, when it has affected Canada, for example, this uh, earlier this summer, it really sets up conditions that are conducive to wildfires. And they've been experiencing just unprecedented wildfires in Canada that have brought a lot of uh, smoke and air pollution into parts of the United States as well. Now, you mentioned earlier uh, carbon emissions, and uh, earlier on this Friday, the shipping industry uh, contributes around 3% of global carbon dioxide. That's around the same uh, as a, a country like Germany. Well, uh, after two weeks of negotiations, the UN's International Maritime Organization agreed a landmark deal to cut emissions, but green campaigners outside the HQ in London said this fell far short of what's needed. Let's take a listen, first of all. The IMO voted to do little or nothing about shipping pollution, instead once again kicking it into the long grass. And unless they agree to half shipping pollution by 2030, then they will not be sticking to their own UN 1.5 degrees C Paris Agreement. Well, back to you, Christina. Uh, so they want to cut uh, carbon emissions uh, by 2030, but uh, climate activists saying that's uh, too little. What do you make of this deal? Yeah, it's great that there is a deal um, on the table because about 90% of um, shipping around the world takes place on boats. So, you know, the goods that we use from different countries really do depend on this system that uses incredibly dirty oil. Um, and so it's a very polluting industry. That said, the near-term goals of this agreement are not as strong as we would like them to be. Um, the scientists around the world tell us that in order to prevent warming of one and a half degrees Celsius or more around the planet, we need to be about having our global emissions of carbon dioxide and other heat trapping gases. And so to commit to cuts of only 20 to 30 percent by 2030 is not as strong as we would like. Now, that said, this is an industry that is going to be harder to decarbonize than other industries. It's long been known that um, the energy sector that brings us our electricity will be one of the first and fastest to decarbonize because we have technologies already in place like solar power and wind power that can really deliver us the electricity that we need. Those solutions aren't as in place for the shipping industry, so it is somewhat understandable that this industry would be a little slower to decarbonize. Christina Dahl, thank you very much for that insight.